That was abrupt. <laughs> hey, friends, my name is Christopher Weisner. I'm one of the pastors here at First Church, and it's an honor to be delivering some good news this evening. Yeah. They thought you'd catch me slipping for the morning time, didn't you? Didn't know I was going to bring that in, did you? Friends, this week, um, one of the things that happened just blows my mind, and so I'm going to share this. Uh, one of the places I go to when I have a lot to do and I need kind of some space to think and uh, just just exist and figure things out is uh, Starbucks. Does anybody, Starbucks fans, coffee fans, where you at? Yeah, yeah, at least coffee fans, right? And so uh, I like to go there, I sit there and just for whatever reason, just the people walking by and things of that nature helps me to be able to think and process and do what needs to be done. So I'm walking up to Starbucks. My mind has got um, a million things, kind of thinking about all the things that need to happen for this week. And I notice that there's two ladies that are coming behind me, but they're kind of far out. Have you ever walked up to the door and you're about like, you, you want to go to open it and you're like, hey, do I hold this for you? Like, I don't know. Like, the, the, like you're, I think you're a little bit more in a car length here. I'm not sure where it goes. Well, I decided to go ahead, and I'm going to uh, hold that door open and kind of wait it out. And I'm like, all right, that's good. And uh, as they come up, uh, one of the ladies is so generous, so nice. She says, hey, I love your shirt. And I was wearing our blue uh, First Church shirt. It says love, um, love without reason on the back. And I was like, oh, that's super cool. Yeah, thank you. Great shirt. And so they go in there, and um, they go ahead of me, and then we're all kind of like standing there. They're like, hey, did you, did you want to go ahead and order? I was like, no, 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 it's good, it's good. You guys, you all go ahead. I'm in no rush. I'm going to be here. And, and honestly, I was like thinking of a million different things. So they go by. They uh, make their purchase. They move over. And I'm like super focused on this glazed donut in the, ca <laughs> in the cabinet. <laughs> I'm like, I'm wondering if that thing's good or not. And uh, I make my order. I did not get the glazed donut, but I did get my caramel macchiato. And uh, I, I go to pay for all this. And I could have swore the person said that it was going to be somewhere around, uh, I got a cup as well, like $12, and it ended up being like $7, something of that nature. And I was just like, well, maybe I just missed her. I, you know, I had, had a lot of things on mine. So I, I go through, I get my drink, and I'm just kind of sitting there processing everything. And she kind of comes back, and goes by, and she just asks, say, hey, did the, the barista give you the gift card? And I was like, oh, it then came dawning on me. Like she had helped pay for part of my order as I was going through the Starbucks. I was like, that is so cool. You've totally made my day. Like what an amazing act of love, right? Like this random person um, decided to make my day just by offering and buying a part of my Starbucks drink, bought my Starbucks drink essentially, and it was just it blew, blew my mind. It took all that concern, all that worry, all that kind of thoughts that I had going on and really refocus and go, man, isn't this beautiful? Friends, we're going to be talking about um, in our series, five essential practices of Jesus. The series is called Follow Me. And what we want to see is we've already spent multiple weeks now talking about who Jesus is. We now know he's the son of God. We know how Jesus plays a part in our lives. But Jesus calls us to follow him, to then go and do and be and be just like Jesus in the world around us. And so we've come, uh, we've narrowed down to five practices. There's obviously more that are in the scriptures. There's more that we could do. But there's five practices that, one, I believe that we as a community here at First Church are already practicing and doing. And two, these are practices that not only do we want to continue, we want to instill them in our children and the next generation. We want those who are just joining along, following Jesus, to learn these five practices. And those of us who have maybe been following Jesus for a, uh, for a while, to then share how these practices have shaped your lives and share that with the wider community. And what's very interesting is, 
Many of these practices, um, we're going to put those up on the screens. We've got a slide. Many of these practices are fairly common. These aren't, these aren't necessarily novel things. Um, love, pray, search, speak, and give. But what's interesting is I've seen so many practices out there. You guys have seen prayer, you've seen worship, you've seen speaking or sharing the good news, you've seen giving. But a lot of times, I don't very rarely ever see any church say that one of the most supreme practices in following Christ is love. It's perhaps buying a gift card for some random person at Starbucks. That that can be something that changes people's life, that that's something that Jesus necessarily calls us to, not necessarily the gift card, but looking out for other people's well-being. So tonight, we're going to start with the first practices, and then the next four weeks, we're going to continue on elaborating on these, and then as a community, we want to join along in these practices, in these doing as we follow Jesus Christ. But before we go further, friends, how about we pray? Jesus, we thank you for your great love. We thank you that you are so much to us in our lives, and now we want to follow you. So we pray that you would help us to understand this uh, one part of what it means to follow you with our very lives. Help us to grow in the love of you, the love of ourselves, and the love of others. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Friends, love is such a complex thing that I think it's best if I try to talk about what it means for us to go be a people of love through some stories. So I want to give you another story. I was in college. Yes, I was in college at one point in time in my life, and while I was there, one of those things that, that I realized in college is there was a fundamental lack of money. Like, I don't know if, you, if anybody else ever found that, like, in the early 20s, like, money was a little bit of a problem, but I found that money was a significant problem, especially towards my junior and senior year of college, and it actually is getting so bad um, that I was having a hard time making a car payment. It got to the point where my car payment was in danger, or car was in danger of being repossessed. In fact, they wanted to come and take that car. Man, isn't that scary? And by the way, I wasn't like near family. It's not like, you know, uh, if you went to State Fair Community College and you're, you know, you're here, you live in Sedalia. Like I was in the mountains of North Georgia. The closest was Savannah, Georgia. So that's about a four-hour drive away at least um, as far as that goes. So I was in threat of like not having a car. And, I, and this is wearing on me and I had no clue what to do and all those kinds of things. Well, some friends invited me to go and just kind of hang out with them um, one night. And from them, I met another friend, um, another person. I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. And we kind of clicked right away, and that was nice. And so we ended up eating lunch the next day. And I was just so bummed. I got, this car was about to be repossessed. It was probably, I think, around like $900. <laughs> Where is that coming? Talking to mom and dad about it for, for whatever reason at that time like, wasn't an option for me. Like I was trying to do things on my own at that point. And... I ended up telling this random person who I met less than 24 hours about kind of what happened. And you know what he goes and says? Oh, we can fix that. We can fix that. I'm like, what? And then let it, lo and behold, he just starts getting on his phone. And he's like, come on, jump in my car. And then we start driving like all over the place. We go down an hour into Atlanta. We can stop at one place to the next place. And my man scrounges up $900 from all these people that owed him random dollars of money. And paid, right? Isn't that so cool? Like, you can't make this up. Like, he just had all these random people who owed him, like, 50 here, 20 there, and there you go. And there you go. Two broke college students were able to somehow figure out how to pay for this car so that I'd be able to keep on driving. Oh, and, of course, then, you know, it just blew my mind that this person who I knew less than 24 hours, who also really didn't have any money of their own, would work so hard to help me in a time of need. He had such a care for my well-being. It blows my mind. Which reminds me of another story. Now, I don't know about you all, but I am horrible at interviews. Anybody else horrible at interviews? Or perhaps, have you ever had an interview that just was really, really bad? Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. I don't actually know how, why Pastor Candace ended up bringing me out here to First Church in a lot of ways, because that interview could not have been that good. 
So I'm pretty sure she said something about the power of the Holy Spirit, like overcompensating. Desperate. Desperate. <laughs> Woo. Uh, woo. There may be some truth to that, friend. Right? So I, um, I am on this path at Family Christian Stores, and um, I'm interviewing to be a, uh, uh, in this new training program for district managers. And so I'm really excited, super scared. This is like a great opportunity to get into multi-unit management. This is a really, really big career milestone. And one of my greatest fans was my district manager, Kibi, uh, Kibi Hood, and he just, man, he invested in me. He was my mentor. We did work together. It was absolutely phenomenal. Can't thank him enough for all the ways that he continued to invest. And so we go to this, like, Chili's dinner interview with this regional vice president, and friends, I ate like two bites. You know you're nervous when you're eating at, you're over at Chili's and you only eat two bites out of that whole meal. And I'm just talking and he's asking all basic questions like situational leadership. What do you do in these random situations? And I'm like, I'm fumbling over my words. I have to look redder in my face than ever. I mean, it just, it was, whew, I'm getting nervous just talking about that right now. It was so bad. We get out in the parking lot. And Kibi just goes, what happened to you? <laughs> like, who was that? Like, <laughs> he's, like he's like, listen, actually, don't tell me. Just don't tell me. Get in your car. I'm going to fix this. <laughs> That's what he says. I'm going to fix this. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take care of this uh, as far as it goes. Because the interview was really, it really was just that bad. I got so nervous, so in my own head. But he stuck his neck out for me. He said, listen. Guy can't interview, obviously, but he can lead. Let's give him an opportunity. And they did end up giving me that opportunity. It was a huge, huge blessing. It's amazing when people can be blessings in your life, people that you work with or walk with in life where they can step up for you and stick their neck out, if you will, right, um, for you just in the moment when you need it. It's really awesome when people you work with care about your well-being. There was also this one time, uh, I got to go on a mission trip to Guatemala, and we went there to go serve at an orphanage in Guatemala. Uh, we did projects, painted walls, um, ended up playing with the kids, doing some uh, BBS Bible study stuff as far as that goes. And I met this one kid, his name was Alberto. And um, as I got to meet Alberto, uh, I had a translator with me, and I got to talk with him through this translator. Uh, I did take about six years of Spanish, and no, I did not learn any Spanish. <sighs> really difficult. <laughs> and so I had a translator, and as he, uh, as he was helping us to talk, I found out that Alberto um, was there, not because he was an orphan in the sense that he had no parents. He was there because his mom was gravely ill, terminally ill, and his dad couldn't take care of her and him at the exact same time. So he was there, and he was sad, and he was going through a really hard time. And so like the first day, this is about a five-day trip, by the way, and so like the first day or so I learned about this, and I tried my best to like connect with him, but it could tell like he's just down. And then something happens by Wednesday, and he just clicks. You know, when the group comes, we start to have a little bit more fun, and he kind of lightens, lightens up a little bit more. You can see a little bit of cheer in his face, and we have that good time. And he ends up showing me, like in Psalm, one of his favorite scriptures where, uh, where it talks about the stars and how God loves each and every one of us in the, in the Psalms. And it's just kind of like a beautiful moment where I got the opportunity to just show that this kid that he, he's cared for, even though his dad can't be with him right there and then, and even though his mom's in a horrible situation. So he got a little bit of smile. He got a little bit of joy. I was able to end up sponsoring, the, sponsoring Alberto for a while. The good news is he did go back to be with his dad. So they were, able, they were able to work that out, and he was able to be able to care for him eventually. And so, you know, it's sometimes when you get to enter into people's lives and to share, um, to share love with them and to care for their well-being, sometimes it's for a moment. You get maybe just a couple days. Sometimes it's for a season. Maybe it's much longer. Sometimes it's even for a lifetime. Here's his last story. 
Last story isn't mine. It comes from a book that I'd read from an American prisoner of war during World War II. And during World War II, we know that the Nazis had many concentration camps. And at these concentration or forced labor camps, they would essentially work people to death. We also know that not only were the Jewish people the target of the Nazi regime, we know obviously the prisoners of wars were also taken to these concentration camps, as long as other minority groups like gypsies and gays and lesbians. And during one of these, um, at one of the camps, the story is retold where a gay priest was brought to this camp. And, And while he was there, he was praying in one of the blocks, one of the areas where they had slept as priests normally do. However, at this particular camp, you weren't supposed to practice your religion. You weren't supposed to pray at all. And so, the SS guards came in and they started to beat him, ruthlessly, over and over again. Called him all kinds of vile names. And this one evening, when they got done, they left, and this Jewish man came up to him and said, hey, you know, like... (laughs) Are you okay? And they tried to like help him up, and they put him up on a, on a bed, and he kind of said, thank you. And then he went back to praying. And he could kind of hear what the priest was saying. And he kind of listened in, and he could hear this priest saying, God, they are good. This is your creation. They are good. And the Jewish man responded, it's like, well, but some men are beasts, and some are evil. But the priest didn't say anything back. He just kept on praying for them. Later, the next day, so that was in the evening, the next day they all had to go out and do the forced labor out in the courtyard. And as they're out there, the SS guard sees the priest once again and decides to go after him. And so they come together and they start continuously beating this guy. And as this Jewish man recounts the story, he says that he's seeing, he felt like he was seeing Jesus. So he knew the story of Jesus. He's seeing Jesus being crucified once again. That this innocent person was just being tore up. And as he was being tore up, something absolutely, what this Jewish man said, miraculous happened. It was an overcast day. It was darkness all around. And then the clouds parted just a mut, just enough for a very strong beam of light to come down, and it fell right and only right on this priest. So much so that it stopped everybody who was working. It stopped all the, S- the SS guards, stopped beating him. And everybody was just kind of like in awe. It's like, what in the world? So much so that that SS guard ended up just, well, guards ended up walking away. And then the priest was heard saying, God, I did my best. Then he passed away. Sometimes love is really, really difficult. Sometimes it's really easy for us to kind of do these gift cards and, and sometimes, you know, we're, we stick our necks out in our jobs for other people and that can be dangerous and definitely um, there's a sense there. Sometimes it's for a moment, a season, or a lifetime. Sometimes when we go out to love, Jesus calls us to even love our enemies. When we talk about love, we're talking about the most foundational practice that Christians are called to. It is literally following following in the path of Jesus Christ. Embracing love as the cornerstone of our faith, we, we strive to embody Christ's unconditional love with every interaction that we have, fostering compassion and empathy and inclusivity within our community. Our desire is to be perfected in the love of God and ourselves and others. This is what Jesus calls us to. Jesus calls us to have the well-being of others in mind at all times. And all of Jesus' actions, when we read the Gospels, all of Jesus' actions are rooted in love. When Jesus goes to feed people and care for them, rooted in love. When he goes to heal people, it's rooted in love. When he goes and is really upset and flips some tables around, it's rooted in love and trying to make a point of what God calls us to. When Jesus even forgives 
those who would betray him, it's rooted in love. When Jesus dies and then rises again, it's rooted in love. All of these things. So much so that the scriptures then are going to testify and say, John, one of the disciples particularly, says, God is love. Because as he witnesses Jesus and knows that Jesus is God, he knows the very nature and essence of who God is. I have another story. This story comes from Luke, chapter, chapter 10, starting in verse 25, when Jesus is being encountered by a lawyer, being challenged, if you will. It says this, Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to in- in- inherit eternal life? This is a fair question to ask of a rabbi. What do I need to do to internal, inherit eternal life? What do I need to do to have the abundant life? What do I need to do to live life well? What do I need to do to follow in God's ways? Verse 26, he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to them, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. Do this, and you will inherit eternal life. Do this, and you will have an abundance of life. Do this, and you are following in God's will. Like, do this and live. This is why this is the core practice, the first practice that we all want to try to get good at as we follow Jesus, learning what it means to love. Now, Love is a word that we use in a lot of different ways for a lot of different things. So just as I shared in each of those stories, they were all stories of love. But as you notice, they all loved looked very different or different in each one. It wasn't the same um, necessarily expression of love. So I want to kind of give us a running definition that we can set our minds on as we go out from this place so that we can kind of consider what does it really mean for me to love God with all my heart, soul, and mind, love others, and love myself just the same. Love. I believe love is the desire and action. Love is the desire and action to seek the well-being of God, ourselves, and others. It is the desire and action to seek the well-being of God, ourselves, and others. We want to act in a way that helps other people's well-being. When we see someone who maybe had done an act of kindness and then we want to repay that with another act of kindness, we're seeking their well-being. When we find out that some random person that we just met within 24 hours ago is in a kind of a really tough spot and we're like, man, I wouldn't want to be without a car, um, so if I can do anything to figure this out, I'm going to help you figure this out. Like that is caring for their well-being. If you're supporting someone and helping them to grow in their career or their job or their workplace or school place or whatnot, and you notice that they had a very difficult interview or they had a very difficult test or situation, and you go and stick your neck out, neck out for them and say, I think this person can still do this, that's caring for their well-being potentially. When you go and perhaps go off into a far-off land and you go hear someone's story and just spend time with them, even if it's just for a short period of time, that's caring for well-being. When you pray for your enemies and do all that you can to love someone who absolutely does not love you, you care for their well-being even though they don't care for your well-being. Well, that's, that's following in the path of Jesus Christ. That's following in God's ways. I think that we can keep that in our minds, that we can remember that when we go out, like, how do I know to love someone in this situation? Consider, how can I take care of their well-being? How can I take care of my well-being? What do you need to do to take care of your own self? And then it may sound awkward to say, how do I take care of God's well-being? But Friends, God wants to be in relationship with you. God delights in you. God wants you to spend time with God as well. We'll talk about some of those other practices that come out, but prayer would be, I think, one of the ones that God appreciates the most. I don't think God takes it for granted when we spend time with God as well. Whether it's following God and Jesus' example and loving people, 
loving ourselves or in prayer or um, multiple other practices that we're going to continue to talk about. But it's having the well-being of others. That's kind of the running definition that we can take away from this place this evening. Consider. Consider this. In Sedalia, we have 25,000 people that so that live here. And, of course, there's a little, lot more that come through the week. Many of you um, reside in Sedalia, but you also reside outside of Sedalia, outside of even maybe in Pettis County as well. For those who are online and joining us, you're all over the United States. Um, and so we have people who are hearing this message today who are on all kinds of different places. And I'd like for you to imagine what would happen, what would it look like in our areas, in our workplaces, our schools, our families, our relationships and friendships, and even the people we don't know, and dare I even say the people that don't have our well-being in their mind as well, what would it look like and happen if each of us became extremely dedicated to living out this practice as much as we can every day? What would change? What would the temperature change when we have our conversations, we're seeking the well-being of, of the other person. How would that change that temperature, perhaps? I think, I think that just as those stories have probably impacted you tonight, and you're probably feeling pretty good, you're saying, man, these are, this is some really good stuff. Like, I, I, man, there's a lot of love here. I'm thinking that as you go and act and make that difference in all those places as well, well, I think you're going to change the lives of many people. I think you are going to make an excruciatingly huge difference for others. Maybe it's a moment, maybe it's a season, maybe it's a lifetime. You are going to do that. And not only you, but when we do this all together as a community, we combine our own resources, we come uh, together in this place for our various events, like for instance, Day of Action that will be in June for our young adults and our, our students. It gives an opportunity for us to make a bigger impact when we combine our talents and skills together in this uh, to, to make a difference. So consider this week. Consider this week how you can love boldly and love well. Consider the opportunities that you have. Once again, there's people all around you at all times, even, by the way, as we go to leave this place in the sanctuary by that lobby, you can already be looking out for other people's well-being. You can already be giving words of life and care. You can already be opening your ears and eyes for those things that you can do to care for each other's well-being. And when we do that, then we're following the essential practice and essential practice of Jesus Christ. Maybe so in our lives. Amen. My friends, uh, this evening we get to partake in communion as a community. <sighs> in community... This, is, uh, this, this sacrament, this uh, practice that we do is a practice of love. This is what Jesus has given us to remember him and remember his life. But it's ultimately, it's a, a reminder of his great love for each and every one of us. And so, we'll have some call and responses will be on screen. As a reminder, the blue parts are for the many and the whiter for the one. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God, your invitation to come and feast in your presence is but a taste of the love you extend to us every day. By your very nature, you are always seeking us out, searching for ways to connect us and to connect with us. You meet us in the most ordinary of places and you make them sacred. By your grace, we come to recognize the holiness that dwells in the world around us, in our neighbors, and in our own eternal depths. Therefore, we join your voices, we join your voices with your people on earth and all the company of the heavens, saying, uh, saying, saying this praise together, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you and blessed is your eternal table. You welcome all who thirst for justice and hunger to grow in love.
You ask us to extend the same welcome to all our neighbors, but God, since our beginning, we have struggled to do so. So, in your love for us, you took on flesh in Jesus. Through his life, you revealed the sacredness in all life. You showed us how to live together, even among forces of destruction. You showed us how to love and have eternal life. You showed us God eats good food with sketchy people, believing it could transform the world. Jesus proclaimed the good news. He called for captives to be set free. He spoke of the lowly being lifted up. His commitment to practicing love knew no bounds, not even the bounds of death. And on the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his companions, even those who would betray and abandon him when he would need them the most. So he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And then at the end of the supper, he took the cup, blessed it, shared it with his disciples saying, take, drink of this. This is the cup of the new covenant, the forgiveness of sins for all people. And so in remembrance of all that you have done to save us, we proclaim this mystery of faith together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit on these gifts, O God. Make these ordinary elements into the sacred gift of your presence with us once again. May they awaken us anew to your everlasting invitation into a life of resurrection. Aliven us in our pursuit of, the, of a world where all needs are met, power is balanced, and the worth of every creature and creation is celebrated. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. I want to invite the communion stewards up to prepare the table. As they come up, communion is a time of God's grace. It gives us an opportunity as a community to come together to remember the love that Jesus has for each of us. When you come forward, we'll come through the center aisle and come off to the sides. You'll simply step up to the person who's holding the bread. You'll cup your hand out, receiving the grace that God has for you this evening. Then you'll take the bread, step over to the chalice, dip the bread in the chalice, and then you may partake of communion. Here at First Church, we practice an open table, which means that all people are welcome. Those who have great faith and those who have none. Those who have heard a lot about Jesus and those who have just heard about Jesus for the first time tonight. Those who have, um, those who have been practicing love and the way of love all their life. And the lo- those who are maybe considering today of walking in this path of love. We want you to know all are welcome to this table. For it is not our table. It is God's table. It is Christ's table. Christ who has died for each of us and risen for each of us. Come now, the table is prepared.